welcome to the stage, Head of Technology, Emerging Tech and Fintech Practices at KPMG Ireland, Anna Scali. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to day two of Web Summit, the biggest and best technology conference in the planet. And a special welcome to everybody joining us here this morning for MoneyConf. MoneyConf is where the leading banks, tech startups and disruptive tech companies and disruptive startups meet together. They meet twice a year, once here in Lisbon and once in Dublin in June. My name is Anna Scali, and I'm going to be your MC here for this morning. I'm also a partner with KPMG in Ireland, where I head up our fintech practice. In October last month, KPMG, in association with H2 Ventures, released the 2018 Fintech 100 Leading Global Innovators Report. That report identifies the leading 50 established fintech companies in the world and the 50 most captivating emerging fintech companies. The 2018 FinTech list this year highlighted the massive acceleration of the disruption that is taking place in the financial services industry. And we're going to hear lots about that here today. Global competition in this area also continues to expand. And of the 100 companies listed on the FinTech 100, there were 36 different countries represented. The US claimed top spot with 18 countries listed, followed by the UK with 12 and China with 11. To learn more about the FinTech 100, or indeed for you to feature on the 2019 FinTech 100, please check out fintech, fintechinnovators.com. So I'm very excited that a lot of the companies that were on that list will be represented here on stage this morning. And today we're going to hear from the likes of World Remit, Revolut, Allianz, Western Union, Elixir, Sockgen, Startling Bank, eToro, Cabbage, and many more of the industry decision makers and the startups who are looking to transform the world of finance. So to kick us off this morning, our first talk on today's MoneyConf stage is a talk on what blockchain means for business. Although this groundbreaking technology remains far from mainstream adoption, it is poised to change the status quo in a wide range of areas. This morning, we hear from a Grammy-winning independent artist as she outlines what blockchain technology can really do and in a number of really creative ways. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a huge welcome to artist and entrepreneur Imogen Heap who will be in conversation with Fortune's Jen Wichner. Please welcome the ladies to the stage. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming, and thank you so much for joining us, Imogen. We are thank so you. pleased to have you. Hello, everyone. So we're going to be talking about blockchain. Um, and how you as a musician came to came across this technology and I, I want to just start a little bit about um, You know how how that journey started for you and you're kind of unique in a way that you've already in your career sort of cut out some of the middlemen so in some ways this was kind of a, a technology that um, Was really uh, you know designed in a way for musicians like you tell us a little bit about that and your journey there well, I, I believe it's not just perfect for me, I believe it's perfect for everyone in the creative industries where they have a creative output and the need or the, the want to share that with the world in any way and to make it easy for people to do business with that creative thing, whether it's a piece of journalism or a song or a, um, you know, a, a, piece, a photograph or a video or a film. Um, because ultimately, uh, a, a very good example maybe is I Went the other, I'm on tour currently, so I'm actually doing a show on Friday, or Saturday if you'd like to come. Um, uh, so I was in Iceland and I was standing next to a, a radio presenter and he was talking to me about 
tour and what we're doing. And, uh, and he said, oh, I'm very embarrassed to say, but we don't have any of your music on our, on our database. And I said, oh, don't worry. Um, and he said, oh, I'm going to play it off YouTube, though. I was like, OK. Um, so he played it off YouTube. But he was embarrassed because he doesn't, he's a radio station. He should have access to all the songs that he wants to play in the whole world at his fingertips at all times, because that's what they're meant to do, like mm -hmm. to share music with the world. Um, so he was embarrassed about that. But then what he has to do in order to, to pay me that money, every year they, they type in all the songs that they've played, and then that takes a very long time. And then they send that in Iceland to a company called Steff, who are the collection society who collect on behalf of the writers. And then Steff sends all of that information to 300 other collection societies around the world. And they individually have to go, oh, these 30 writers are our ones. So could you please send us the money for those 30 writers? So there's like a lot of back and forth going on. But if we just had one database of all of the songs in the world, verified, distributed, decentralized, database of songs, it would save thousands and thousands of people's hours and millions of hours of people's time. Because the reality is that the money that would have got into my bank account, if it actually reaches me at all, um, would probably be about five pence um, for that play. Um, but it would have cost the system at least a hundred times that to make that payment to me. Mm. So it's extremely inefficient. So I got very excited about this idea of blockchain technology and a, and a distributed database where everybody accesses and shares the same information, saving the system so much time and money, and eventually opening up all kinds of new possibilities for music makers to make money. It sounds like you actually discovered the concept, you know, the benefits of decentrali decentralization before you even discovered blockchain as a technology. Who was it who kind of brought it to you and said, you know, maybe this could work for what you're talking about? Um, yeah, I suppose 20 years of frustration in the music industry about not really knowing where things came from, why have I got this amount of money in my bank account, why has it taken two years to get there, um, not, being, not having any real way to audit anything. Um, and I was lamenting with a friend of mine called Zoe Keating, who's a musician. She was just about to go and play at a blockchain conference as a musician. She'd just been doing a little bit of research. And I was about to release a new song called Tiny Human that I'd just written. I was a new mum of about three months. I was completely exhausted. I don't have a manager. I don't have a record label. I don't have a publisher by choice. Um, but as a result, you see the reality of the intense complexity of the music industry and how much time and effort you have to spend to release anything and get it out into the world to try to even let people hear about it because there's so much so much music released every single second of every day um, that I just became overwhelmed and I thought oh, there must be a simpler way and so she told me about blockchain and, uh, and she sent me to this, um, well, I met this man called Vinay Gupta, who was a project launch lead for Ethereum, and he explained this concept of smart contracts to me. And I thought, wow, imagine the song itself with all of the data intact, all the licensing agreements, all the acknowledgements, all of the publishing, the, the correct lyrics, whatever you need to know about that song in one place, and that the, the payment of that play could happen instantaneously via a smart contract paying everyone at one time. Um, so I did a little experiment. Instead of releasing it and, you know, trying to get people to know it was there, which is it's very hard to do, um, unless you pay a lot of money to get um, to kind of shout above the noise in advertising. Um, I essentially just did an experiment um, and I opened it up to blockchain developers just to say, here's all the data that you could have about a song and music services. What would you do with that? And so Ujo Music came up with the first smart contract for a song. So the smart contract is sort of designed to provide credit and then eventual payment where it's due. And you actually had a personal experience recently. You had a track featured on Ariana Grande's album, is that right? That's How did right. that? Um, yeah, so Ariana Grande, um, some of you may have heard of her, some of you may have not. She's a huge superstar. Um, maybe your children know about her. And uh, she, she's a longtime fan of me. And one of her favorite songs is a song called Good Night and Go. And to my... One of my favorites know. as well. Oh, really? Oh, good to know. Um, so, you know, this was written 15 years ago. And uh, she really loved the song. And so she ended up putting it on her record. But she added a little verse. And so the, the actual distribution of the song is kind of... You know, it's not 100% to me, it's 90% to me and 10% to her. So that's great. So, but then when it came to releasing the record, my name wasn't on the album. Um, and obviously Ariana Grande, it's not Ariana Grande's fault. She would be mortified. She is mortified um, <laughs> because, you know, she's a huge fan and she's desperately embarrassed. Um, so what happened there um, is somebody just decided to not check things and they put it on a, 
on the liner notes, and now it's embedded in for eternity or until the next run of, of physical copies, um, that I'm not the writer. And a lot of my fans are very angry about it, and they're angry to her because they think it's her fault. Mm -hmm. So what then has to, has to happen is I have to call up the manager, and then the manager has to call up the label, and then the label has to call up the DSPs, and then DSPs have to talk to the publishers, and da 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 da, -da. And it takes a very long time to just say, Imogen Heap is a writer. Whereas a smart contract could do that instantaneously or almost? Yeah, well, the smart contract could um, deliver the payment. Um, how we author the data into the smart contract is, um, or into the database for the, uh, the data for the song, is what we've been developing, which is this little thing here. It's like a physical kind of example of the kind of data which you can't see. Um, but it's something we created to show the music industry what we're talking about. It's basically an identity for music makers where you can share your skill sets, your passions, your inspirations to try to bring like the 95% of my income actually comes from outside of streaming and physical sales. Oh, wow. Wow. It comes from like so you know, doing proportion. a private show or a brand um, commission or music for a play or you know uh, a lesson or a workshop or whatever it might be because everybody has these different skill sets um, and so ultimately in the future I do believe we're based maybe in the next five years we will have something like this um, shared database where everybody's interfacing with um, we need a, to find a way so that the individual music makers can author into that database so that they can change things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't, again, cost the system this person. Can you call this person to this person da, 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 to actually make it happen? I could just go, Imogen Heap verifies, connects with all the other writers and Ariana, everybody accepts, off it goes to the, to the database to a verified change of content. Yeah, and you've started off developing on the Ethereum blockchain, but you're looking at different protocols. Explain a little bit about how you're going about finding the right blockchain protocol to use. Yeah, um, yeah, it's been, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not a blockchain expert in any way. I'm like, <laughs> I, I kind of get a bit, you know, enough to kind of understand what we need to develop, how, who we can try to go with. And it was a bit of a challenge understanding that the Bitcoin blockchain at the time, four years ago, uh, wasn't really equipped to do this smart contract functionality, but Ethereum was. Um, but then also finding, you know, the developers to help develop this has been quite challenging um, because it's, it's a non-profit, so it's coming out of my own pocket. So it's been about trying to find the right group of people. Um, and ultimately, I met a man called Greg Meredith, who is from our chain, and he's uh, it's a currently off-chain system, but it's going to be on-chain next year. And when I spoke to him about how he develops his technology, and he talked to me about um, patterns in nature and viable systems thinking, and you know, this project is called Mycelia, which is the largest organism that lives beneath our feet, and trees and mushrooms grow from it. And so I. I talk about mycelia as being the metaphor for the songs and the music maker layer that we need in order to grow these, all these new services and create a flourishing in the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, so eventually we decided to go with our chain. So we're developing at the moment um, the, the identity bit on the our chain blockchain. Mm -hmm. And what's the status of the project right now? I mean, is this years away or months away? Yeah, I mean, to get to like the end of the roadmap, which I'm sure will change again and again, um, maybe it'll be five, ten years. Mm -hmm. But the bit that we can already do to just start the movement to help music makers be a part of the change um, and not just kind of recreate old problems, but just with blockchain technology, um, but actually be able to be uh, a kind of an active member of problem solving as an individual. Um, because we hold all the data around ourselves, around our works, around our connections, around you know, the gear we've used or where in the world we made it or who were the other people making that song. Um, so on December the 9th, which is my birthday, I always try to do things on my birthday because it's a nice excuse to get people to come and help me. It's my birthday. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so on the 9th of December, we're going to have uh, a very basic app that you're going to be able to download. It's going to be on test flight. It's not even going to be official in the app store yet, mm -hmm. um, where we're just inviting musicians that we've met on this tour. Um, we've met hundreds of thousands of musicians um, to try to, to get a few of them to download the app put them on the map just to show themselves their name and where they are in the world and then they can then go on and verify their peers peer-to-peer -peer with a QR code and we can start to visualize and map the community of the music uh, the music makers because I think once we start to show ourselves and show that we're data organized and we are we want to move into this space we want to be part of the of the future we want to help grow our our ecosystem from the ground up, then maybe services might start to think, okay, that's well, that's interesting. There's a there's 10,000 music makers, or there's a million music makers there, who can, for example, 
uh, you know, somebody like Spotify or iTunes um, kind of pay people to generate biographies for their services for some of the artists on, you know, the, the mm. kind of lead artists. And that cost, that, uh, that research into making that profile, that biography, might take 10 minutes, 10 minutes of somebody's time done time and time and time and time again for all of the different services. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very out of date because they might use a company who hasn't updated you for 10 years because they don't consider you as important as somebody like Adele. Um, so how can we help that? It's very basic. You could just have your biography that's constantly being um, scraped and updated. Um, and instead of a service updating your biography, maybe badly, um, because not everybody has a Wikipedia or whatever, um, we could actually be paid to do that ourselves. So mm -hmm. it could be an, another source of income by generating content that services need um, and making it easy for them to uh, to work with us. Yeah, where do these, you know, whether it's a streaming service like Spotify or an Apple Music or, you know, any of the labels, where do they fit into this? Because it seems like, you know, if you're, you'd be, get, it's great for artists, you'd be getting a greater cut, but it doesn't, it sounds like they have an interest in preventing this from happening so they can still control it and control the money flow. Um, no, 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 the DSPs don't have uh, an interest in not making friends with the music makers. Um, mm. It's ultimately, it's an industry that's over a hundred years. Um, you know, it's come from somebody performing a song on the radio with a live band and the songwriters, the publishers wanted to get paid for that song. So that's where the collection societies came from, is these, these bodies of people would go around and they would take notes of what songs they played and then would get the money from the radio station and then they would give that to the collection society and then they would distribute that to the publishers, probably not to the writers because that didn't really work out back then. <laughs> um, so that's where it's come from, it's a very kind of manual process. Um, but for Spotify to pay me, um, it has to go through lots of hoops to get there. And it's, you know, it has the money, it wants to pay it out. Um, it's just very hard to get to me. So how can we make it easy for services to, you know, just save money, do the right thing, um, get that pay to play just like as quick as it is to put a piece of music up online. It takes like, you know, well, 10 minutes or something to put it across all the platforms mm -hmm. and like by distribution, by distributor. Um, but that innovation needs to happen the way back too. Yeah, so maybe it actually makes the whole music industry more decentralized instead of just Spotify. Maybe there will be more different services that can provide an outlet for these artists. Yeah, I mean, that is a hurdle. If you're developing a, uh, a new music service, you ultimately have to get the permissions to use the songs in the first place. So companies are at a disadvantage because they have to come up with a ton of money to pay uh, ma ma basically ma mostly the major labels to, uh, to have access to put those songs on their service. And then beyond that, they pay a small payment uh, per play or prescription or sub subscription or whatever. Um, so that's a very big hurdle. So if there are any like developers out there, which I know there are, I meet them all the time. They're like, oh, I've got this brilliant idea for, a, for an app and oh God, but we've just been wrestling with the licensing for like two years. They're just asking so much money. And the reality is that the music makers don't get that money. Um, the companies get that money. And so how can we make it again easy for people to innovate and create new services without the hurdles of having to pay these huge licensing fees? Mm. Um, I mean, it's also, you know, it's not, it's just a, a, a kind of byproduct of the system in that um, the, the major labels are really, and, and the publishers are the only ones really funding musicians because they understand um, where the opacity is and where the money is. Um, but I think that's the very exciting thing about blockchain in general and kind of ICOs and people independently being able to put their money into things which they care about um, is that we can actually uh, relieve the labels and the publishers of being the only money holders uh, or, you know, the development money for artists or whatever. Yeah. But actually anyone in the room could, if they like a song, they could invest in that song or they mm -hmm. could invest in an artist. If we can create transparency in the value chain, then anyone would do that. I mean, I remember... 15 years ago, I was trying to release a record of my own. I wanted to get outside of the label system because it didn't make monetary sense to give 85% of my income away to wow. a company when it was turning into a digital space. Yeah, and so I went into a bank. I went to lots of banks. 
uh, with my records and I said, hello, um, I'm a musician and I've got a few records here and I just wanted to show you some figures to show that if I did this by myself, I'd actually make a lot more money than if I signed a record deal, but I just need 100,000 for the next year to make this record in the way that I want it and to release it on my own label. And they just laughed at me. Um, because they're Just like, 100,000? Yeah, they're yeah. like, well, well, it is just 100,000, but like, I would have made that back mm -hmm. in, you know, I knew the amount of sales I could make. Sure. And I would have made it back in two years plus some. Um, but they just said, well, what's your, where's your income? Show us how you receive the money back. And I just couldn't. Mm. I couldn't show them because the statements that we get from all the different um, you know, inputs, whether it's performance royalties or composition royalties or whatever it might be, um, it's just impossible to navigate. Yeah. Well, you brought up initial coin offerings. Does that mean you know, in this project as you're envisioning it, is there a role for cryptocurrency? Will we see an Imogen coin? Um, well, who knows? I mean, people have already started to develop their own coins, and yeah. I think that's something that we will see part of. Just as kind of as we now do, we, you might have a fan base who might kind of get you know, special credits if they've given more time on the street delivering flyers or whatever. You know, that's what we used to do. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a potential for uh, investing in a person, in a product, in a brand. Um, and I think, yeah, I was going to say something really good then, and then I saw the clock and I was like, oh no. Um, yeah, so I think, oh, but uh, yeah, so in terms of the system of this kind of, this uh, layer of music makers and songs and how do we actually create that flow and incentivization for those who currently hold lots of data? I mean, there's companies, huge companies who have massive databases, but they're not entire and complete because they don't have a way to integrate the 95% of music that gets pushed up online every day that isn't connected to one of their services, independent artists. So yeah, I think um, incentivization around adding data into the system for monetary reward, um, uh, but then it's attributed to the music maker. We, we have a whole thing. But yeah, there is tokenization involved in it. So it is a possibility we will be able to one day buy into Imogen tokens. You're not ruling it out. No, I'm not ruling it out. No. <laughs> well, maybe we have that to look forward to. That's a good note to end on. But thank you so much for being here, Imogen. Thank you, this thank was you. great. Cheers. Thank you. Goodbye.